Hi, my name is Hamira Gilzai, and today I'll be sharing with you about my pilgrimage to Mecca as a secular woman. I was raised in a secular family in Afghanistan in the 1970s. My father was an academic who studied all religions with a slight preference for Islam. My mother wasn't devout Muslim either, but she feared for her children's soul. So she arranged for formal religious instructions for my brother and I at the local mosque. After a month of lessons, my Islamic education came to an abrupt end at the formidable age of nine. Please note that I am not an Islamic expert or historian. What I'll share with you is based on my personal experiences and research. I hope my presentation will shed light and demystify a sacred ritual that 1.8 billion Muslims around the world wish to partake in at some point in their life. I hope you enjoy the rest of my presentation. So as you can see in this photo, I was a tomboy and a protective sister. Unlike most girls in my class, I loved wearing t-shirts, jeans, and playing soccer. On Quran lesson days, my mother made sure I dressed properly, especially that I wore a headscarf. Of course, when we first started taking Quran lessons and the mullah saw our mother dressed in modern clothes, he pegged us as fair weather Muslims. So one day when he had guests present, he singled my brother and I out for ridicule. He declared, that our mother was a sinner in the eyes of Allah because she wore skirts and she showed her legs. Well, of course, I was not gonna have any of this. This was 1977, long before the Taliban. I corrected the mullah, noting that Islam gave women and men the same rights. When he told me to shut up, I called him a liar. Well, that didn't sit very well with the mullah, who landed a slap on my seven-year-old brother's face to punish me for my disobedience. As a protective big sister, I grabbed my brother's hand and we ran out of the mosque as I called the mullah and his guests names that should not be repeated in this video. So our hearts were thumping. We leapt over the shoes piled neatly and arranged outside the mosque's door and we plunged in the deep cobble winter snow and our bare feet running away as fast as we could. We realized we weren't followed so shivering and scared my brother with a red handprint on his face wanted to go home but I wanted my boots and I wanted revenge so we snuck back to the mosque grabbed our boots, and as a last act of defiance, filled all the remaining shoes at the mosque door with snow. Around a year after this incident, we moved to the United States, escaping the communist invasion of Afghanistan. As a new immigrant in the Bay Area, we didn't have many people to celebrate Muslim holidays with. And since I no longer heard the call to prayer five times a day, a reminder to all Muslims living in countries where Islam is predominantly practiced. I somehow forgot about the details of my faith and became a cultural Muslim. Living in San Francisco, far from the Afghan community in the Bay Area, I only see the inside of a mosque when there's a funeral. So you can imagine everyone's surprise when I announced my decision to make a pilgrimage to Mecca. Friends and family stared at me blankly and asked if I was okay. They wondered loudly if I'm having a midlife crisis. My daughter worried that I will return as a hijab wearing devout Muslim who will probably embarrass her at school. So how did this all come about? Well, it was about two years prior to this when I entertained the thought that it would be an adventure to go on a pilgrimage. After all, when I saw Pope John Paul II speak at the Vatican, I was in tears. So I imagine it would be even more moving going to visit Islam's holiest sites, donned in white clothes from head to toe, 
following the footsteps of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. But since I had two kids and a career, I put this idea on my bucket list. But as they say in Afghanistan, when Allah wants to see you, you are summoned to Mecca. And that's exactly what happened to me. The opportunity to take the trip came sooner than I expected. My aunt told me that she was going on a minor pilgrimage with groups of Afghan American elders and she wondered if I want to join them. Of course, I accepted thinking this could be a fun way to hang out with my favorite aunt and see another country. Oh, and yes, I, I thought that it would also be uh, interesting to experience the holy sites of Islam. But the euphoria of my decision turned into a burden when elder relatives called to congratulate me for making the holy pilgrimage. Some of them asked me to pray for them. Pray, I thought, I don't know how to pray. Some confessed that they're too old to make the journey personally, so I can be their surrogate. Surprised by the reception, I realized I was stepping into a bigger obligation than I had anticipated. Instead of bailing on the trip, I took to heart the words of Rumi. Keep walking, though there is no place to get to. Don't try to see through the distances. That's not for human beings. Move within, but don't move the way fear makes you move. There are two kinds of pilgrimages to Mecca, an Umrah and Hajj. Umrah is the minor pilgrimage that at any time of the year that the Saudi government allocates for a minor pilgrimage. Hajj is the major pilgrimage, which also fulfills one of the five pillars of Islam. Hajj is done once a year during the five day period in the last month of the Islamic year. I did Umrah, the minor pilgrimage. Unbeknownst to me, there's a lot that goes into getting ready for a pilgrimage. Before preparing spiritually for the pilgrimage, I had to tackle the visa instructions that were sent to us by the travel agency. If a woman is traveling without a maran, a male relative, husband, brother, father, uncle, or family member, she must get notarized permission slip as part of the visa application. Needless to say, my American husband, Jim, enjoyed his newly elevated status and at first jokingly refused to sign my permission slip. It's rumored that someone, sometimes the Saudi embassy refuses entry visas to younger women who travel without a male relative. I was advised to take, to look humble, plain and pious, worthy of going on a pilgrimage on my visa photos. It took the CVS photographer many attempts to capture me with an appropriately saintly look and without my hair peeking out from under my headscarf. With my visa forms on the way, I had to tackle the next pressing issue, proper attire for this pilgrimage. My mother warned me, don't shame our family by wearing something revealing, as if I was planning on wearing a mini skirt and tank top. But after a quick inventory of my wardrobe, I saw her point. Not a single item in my closet was long enough, loose enough, or pious enough for this journey. After a quick Google search, I landed on East Essence, a Silicon Valley based online Islamic clothing store, which carries appropriate outfits and hut covers for this pilgrimage. So I travel to Afghanistan regularly for my nonprofit organization, Afghan Friends Network. So I thought I was well first, versed and wearing headscarves until I opened my pilgrimage headscarf package. In dire need of instruction, I searched the internet and found the YouTube channel Hijab Trends with a Z. They demonstrated many ways to wear a hijab properly. So it covers your hair and stays in place. Although I always thought wearing a headscarf is burdensome and unattractive, I was quite taken by the lady's enthusiasm demonstrating how to wear a colorful headscarf for a wedding party. You see, when I was growing up in Afghanistan, my mother and aunts only 
wore a headscarf to a funeral. It was considered provincial and unfashionable to wear a headscarf otherwise. So even though I'm surrounded and immersed in Afghan culture, somehow I carried that prejudice with me. Somehow stereotyping anyone who wore a headscarf as uneducated and oppressed. After a few tries, I got very good at wearing a hijab. And I must admit, it was a relief not to worry about styling my hair or washing it. With my wardrobe set, I tackled the next pressing problem, learning how to pray five times a day. No self-respecting Muslim will admit publicly that they don't know how to pray. And I wasn't about to turn to anyone for help. I quietly cursed the mullah who ended my religious studies at the age nine, and again turned to the internet for help. Although 1.6 billion Muslims believe in one God, actually 1.8 billion. <laughs> <laughs> Although 1.8 billion Muslims believe in one God, Allah, their practice of Islam differs greatly. I was overwhelmed by the myriad of different prayer practices, but then I came across the Muslim Converts website. It dumbed down step-by-step -step instructions covering the five daily prayers for newly converts. After practicing the printed instructions, I graduated to a YouTube prayer channel where each of the five prayers is performed in easy to follow videos. The prophet intended the prayer to be a time not to only serve as a time to think about God, but it's also a quiet meditative moment to refuel our mind. Today, we call this a mindfulness practice. Also, the motion of bending, kneeling, moving up and down helps with circulation, digestion, and muscle development. It became apparent to me that my knowledge of Islam and Prophet peace be upon him, were limited to stories from my childhood. The preparation for pilgrimage gave me the motivation to dig deeper, to better understand Islam and the Prophet's teachings. The key themes of the Prophet's message in Mecca were the oneness of God, the rejection of polytheism, generosity towards the poor and the needy, and equality between men and women before God. I look forward to meeting Muslims from Africa, India, Indonesia, and even the United States. After all, in Mecca, during a pilgrimage, everyone is meant to be equal. Wealth, gender, race, and status are irrelevant in the eyes of Allah. So, on my Emirates flight from San Francisco to Dubai, I found that there were quite a few pilgrims. And talking to Sahar, not pictured in this video, an affable 14-year-old Afghan-American girl from Fremont. I found that it has been her dream to do the pilgrimage and see the home of God. I asked, why not Disneyland or Hawaii? She shrugged and said she doesn't know. Sahar was traveling with her parents, siblings, cousins, aunts, and uncles. And then I asked her, well, what about your friends? Do they think it's weird you're going to a pilgrimage for spring break? And she said, no, her friends were very happy for her. I met this Indonesian family in the immigration line. They were all very excited to be together during their school holiday in Mecca. And then here are siblings from South Africa. Their mother owns a hardware store. And the two siblings in the front work at her hardware store and the brother in the back goes to college. I met, these adorable I met these adorable siblings at the Prophet's Mosque in Medina. They were the only Saudi family I met during my entire 12 day trip. The siblings were with their mother who was wearing a naqab, which is, means that her whole face was covered. She only had a slit where her eyes showed. I was desperate to capture the little uh, one's cuteness to share with my own kids. Once the mother noticed me, I pointed to the children and then my iPhone assuming she understands miming. She replied in perfect English, why do you want to talk to my children? And from there, we went on to talk. If you're wondering how you too can go on a pilgrimage, 
this is what you need to do. First, you have to be a Muslim. Converts are especially welcome. Second, you have to find yourself a travel group. Saudi government allo allocates certain times of the year for Umrah and Hajj. They also allocate a certain number of visas for pilgrims from each country. Travel agencies make it easier to manage the number of visa processed, not to mention traffic from pilgrimage buses, capacity at hotels, and food allocation. A Saudi economist confirmed that in 2014, Saudi Arabia made $18.6 billion from Hajj and Umrah. All Umrah and Hajj trips have the same itinerary. First stop in Medina and then off to Mecca. I found what people look for in finding a tour group is a common culture. There were Iranians, Afghan American groups, Indonesian, Pakistani, uh, Turkish, and we all stayed at different hotels. Medina has a population of 1.2 million. At first glance, the city is quite unremarkable, with monochromatic khaki-colored buildings, unruly traffic, and garbage-strewn sidewalks. What brings millions of visitors to the city are the various holy sites, mosques, and historical locations where Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, fought for survival and advancement of Islam. But the crown jewel of the city and the main attraction for pilgrims is the Masjid al-Nabawi, the Prophet's Mosque. Prophet Muhammad is buried in this site, making it the second holiest place in Islam. The spectacular mosque glows like a flawless diamond. At night, it emanates light from genuine gold light fixtures perched high on ornate tiled towers. This breathtaking sight countered my vision prior to the visit of a gloomy edifice where women would be draped in black hijab reciting the Quran solemnly and praying for forgiveness. Pilgrims pray inside the mosque to be near the tomb of Prophet Muhammad, but I loved the outside, where there were plenty of places to sit, pray, and mingle with other pilgrims. During the day, large umbrella-like canopies would open into uh, the air, like water lilies, when the hot Arabian desert started to warm up the marble tiles. I sat for hours between prayers and people watched. What I found is a place of joy where children were playing chase, families gathered around a picnic between prayers. During Friday prayers, over a million people, local and pilgrim, gather for afternoon prayer. I found the mosque to be as lively as Piazza San Marco in Venice. Through these photos, I hope you will get a sense of the beautiful energy surrounding this holy site and a glimpse into the lives of authentic Muslims who are not represented in my, my mind's image of the Muslim world. There is no place on earth as cherished as holy to as many people as the Kaaba, home of God. Located in Mecca, the birthplace of Prophet Muhammad. During Hajj, Mecca's population almost doubles to 6 million. Every year, Hajj is the single largest gathering of people in one place on earth. I grew up seeing framed pictures of the holy site on people's walls, coffee tables, and even computer screens. I always wonder how it would feel like to stand in front of Kaaba, touch it, circle it like millions of Muslims do every year. So I was thrilled to finally reach the city of Mecca after an eight hour bus ride from Medina. Our journey was meant to recreate the Prophet's journey when he left his political and religious asylum in Medina to reclaim his right to practice and spread Islam in Mecca, his birthplace. Of course, the Prophet didn't have an air-conditioned bus nor a five-star hotel to stay in once he arrived in Mecca. Once we checked into our room, it was around 10 p.m. at night. We wasted no time to make our way to Kaaba to start the Umrah rituals which all pilgrims go through. We were lucky to be staying at a hotel directly across from the entrance of Masjid al-Haram, the Haram Mosque, which surrounds the Kaaba. Once we entered into the mosque, I was advised by my group leader 
to close my eyes. Tradition says that one's first sighting of Kaaba is the most potent time for getting a wish fulfilled. My heart beat fast and my legs grew weak from excitement as I was led down prickly paths in windy halls. I racked my brain thinking of my worthiest wish as the Kaaba grew closer. After many twists, turns, and stumbles along the rough walkway, we stopped. I was told, go ahead, open your eyes. I did, and there it was, that familiar building that I so wished to see right in front of me. Except, I didn't feel anything upon seeing it. Women in my group were crying in each other's arms, reciting the Quran prayers. I just stood there, wondering, how tall is this building? And what is that black cover made of? Embarrassed by my lack of emotion, I tried to squeeze out a tear, but nothing came out. So you can't imagine how disappointed I was in myself for not having a revelation, a spiritual connection, a single stirring in my heart. I stood apart from my enlightened group, feeling like an underwhelmed child on Christmas Day, putting on a brave face. I envied everyone who was humbled, moved, ecstatic by being so close to the home of God. After my failure to connect to Kaaba, I decided to find someone or something to blame. So with my husband so far away, I had to find others to hold responsible. I thought, okay, it was crowds. Yes, it had to be. I didn't have any space to breathe. I would have felt much more spiritual if I could breathe, or it was the eight hours of travel from Medina to Mecca, or perhaps the fumes from the bus, or maybe it was me. I just had too many unanswered questions that kept me from believing. One of those was, how did Kaaba become home of God? It turns out that there are slightly differing accounts of how Kaaba was created and why it's the home of God for Muslims. However, everybody agrees that Abraham built the first Kaaba. Since Muslims designated Kaaba as the home of Allah, they also believed that there are two Kaabas, one on earth and the other one directly above it in heaven, where 70,000 angels pray for Muslims. Muslims turn to the Kaaba five times a day for prayer, no matter where they are on, in the world. Two things people think about when they think of the Kaaba, that it's a cube and it's black. And I always thought that fabric draped in the Kaaba is velvet, but much to my surprise, I learned that the black cover is made of silk. It's called Kiswa in Arabic. The Kiswa is made from 1,477 pounds of silk, which goes through specific processing to create a thick, almost rubber-like panels that can withstand wear and tear that it faces when pilgrims touch, rub, and even drape themselves against the Kaaba. Master craftsmen in Saudi Arabia use 330 pounds of gold thread to stitch surahs of the Quran onto the Kaaba, oh, sorry, onto the Kiswa. The cover is changed once a year on the ninth day of the 12th month of the Islamic year. It usually falls on the second day of Hajj pilgrimage. At first, the Kiswa was created in different colors, but since 1207, black has been permanently adopted. Now I'd like to cover the rituals of Umrah pilgrimage. First, you have to enter into a state of intent. Prior to wearing my new Irham, the simple white outfits required for that pilgrimage, I was instructed to clip my nails, take a shower, and make the intent for doing the Umrah. Perfumes, makeup, or extravagant clothes are discouraged from the time you enter Erham until the pilgrimage ritual is over. The simple white clothes breaks down any wealth or status barrier, and it unites the pilgrims in their stated intent to perform the pilgrimage of Umrah. The men's erham are usually two pieces of cloth without stitching, held together by a belt or a band. 
Once we reached Mecca, Tawaf is the first act of circling the Kaaba seven times counterclockwise while reciting specific verses of the Quran. The first three circuits are at a hurried pace, followed by four times at a leisurely pace. The circling is believed to demonstrate the unity of the believers in the worship of the one God as they move in harmony together around the Kaaba. Some people walked in a meditative state, reciting verses of the Quran. Others had tears in their eyes, perhaps not believing that they were there, the presence of God. And then there were people like me, clinging to a cold pilgrim, fearing being lost, trampled, or even worse, losing my hijab. Tawaf can be done at a time, at any time, but it counts towards the Umrah only if you do it in conjunction with all the ritual steps. That is why in the photo that you see, people are not in the state of Ilham if they're wearing black or other colored clothes. All the white people are doing a pilgrimage. Sayi is the next step of the ritual. It's to walk between the hills of Marwa and Safa. Sayi consists of walking rapidly back and forth between the hills of Safa and Marwa. These hills are housed in the building next to the Kaaba. Sayi is the reenactment of Hajar's frantic search for water after Prophet Abraham, her husband, was commanded by God to leave her and her infant son Ismail in the desert between Safa and Marwa hills. Once Hajar ran out of water from her basic provisions, she went in search of water to keep baby Ismail alive. She first climbed Safa to look over the surrounding areas. Unsuccessful, she then ran up Myra to look in other directions for help. Of course, during Hajar's ordeal, the pathway between the two hills were not covered and they were exposed to the Saudi Arabian hot weather. She didn't have a cool place to go back and forth like we did. Hajar traveled back and forth between the two hills seven times in the scorching Saudi heat before returning to her son Ismail, only to find a water well revealed where the baby Ismail's heel had been striking the ground as he screamed from thirst. There are slightly differing versions of how the Zamzam well, which was found under baby Ismail's foot, was found. However, everybody's in agreement that the well water saved Hajar and Ismail's life. It said the well was Allah's reward for her patience. Pilgrims drink the well's holy water, believing it to have healing powers. Originally, the water from the well was drawn via ropes and buckets, while pilgrims drank at its source. Now it's protected from the public and a high tech hydraulic system draws that water from the ground. Zamzam water is available throughout Masjid Haram via water fountains. Taqseed is exiting at home. It's the act of cutting one's hair and the last step of the Umrah ritual. It's meant to demonstrate sincerity and humility to Allah without caring for one's physical appearance. Some men shave their heads to show their devotion to Allah. Women are encouraged to only cut a snippet of their hair and forgo the drastic act of shaving. I felt a little guilty as it was cheating the system since cutting an inch off my long hair is barely noticeable. It really didn't seem like a big sacrifice for me, but I was happy to bring closure to our important journey so I could go to bed at four in the morning, Saudi Arabia time. During my 12 day pilgrimage, I met Muslims with varying motivation for doing the pilgrimage. Some of my co-travelers proudly informed me that their annual vacation was to go to Mecca rather than Hawaii, like the young girl, Sahad, who I mentioned before. A group of women I met treated it as a girl's trip. So rather than going to Las Vegas, they chose to go on a pilgrimage to renew their friendship and their spirituality. And then there were the Zalits on their third or fourth pilgrimage. They were more focused on picking on others or preaching the right or wrong way of doing things than focusing on their own spirituality. 
But then there were truly devout and spiritually enlightened pilgrims, like my friend Sun Ya, who has made the pilgrimage 10 times. She took me under her wing, became my pilgrimage mentor. Her unconditional love and acceptance of everyone she met was very remarkable. She could see that I was in a different stage of my spiritual quest and went out of her way to validate my journey. Her genuine love of Islam, the Prophet, and doing the pilgrimage was inspiring. She dispensed information without judgment and she provided support when I needed it. She encouraged my questions. She noted that individual thinking and clear intent is more important than doing the Umrah rituals without understanding their true meaning. Sunya is deeply immersed in her love of Islam, and I could see she drew energy from her visit to the holy sites. It was my interaction with her that gave me a deeper appreciation of the motivation, the rituals, and beauty of the pilgrimage. Thanks to Sunya, the experience encouraged me to look within myself for understanding, acceptance, and approval. Go back. Thanks to Sunya, the experience encouraged me to look within myself for understanding, acceptance, and appreciation before I look to others. Thank you.